I came to Greeter Hall with Mr. Jackson. Like all his books and furniture, I moved in. Mr. Salby and Miss Edith are away travelling and will return on the 4th of September. And at the moment, I am looking after the little ones. I still don't know why Mr. Salby just didn't ask you to visit them. However, I will try and stop rabbiting and tell you a little bit about this amazing house. We have Mr. Jackson's vision to thank for you to all. And no house can stand through the years without acquiring a character and atmosphere of its own. Greeter Hall, although not notable for its great architecture, has some claim to be regarded as the house with the richest literary associations in the whole of England. Mr. Jackson raised himself from a common carrier to that of a wealthy man. He was admirable, largely self-educated, and exceptionally, exceptionally well-read. He lived frugally, but was so generous towards others, loved books and honoured their authors. Slowly but surely, from, eight, from 1782, Mr Jackson started to, to buy land at this end of the town. And on this low hill, in this lovely setting, he set about completing this house. There was a boy, ye knew him well, ye cliffs and islands of Winander. Many a time at evening, when the stars had just begun to move along the edges of the hills, rising or setting, would he stand alone, beneath the trees or by the glimmering lake, and there, with fingers interwoven, both hands pressed closely palm to palm, and to his mouth uplifted, he, as through an instrument, blew mimic hootings to the silent owls that they might answer him. And they would shout across the watery vale and shout again, responsive to his call with quivering peals and long hellos and screams and echoes loud, redoubled and redoubled, concourse wild of mirth and jocund din. And when it chanced that pauses of deep silence mocked his skill, then sometimes in that silence, while he hung listening, a gentle shock of mild surprise has carried far into his heart the voice of mountain torrents. Or the vi visible scene would enter unawares into his mind with all its solemn imagery, its rocks, its woods, that uncertain heaven received into the bosom of the steady lake. This boy was taken from his mates and died in childhood ere he was full ten years old. Fair are the woods and beauteous is the spot the vale where he was born, the churchyard hangs upon a slope above the village school. And there along that bank, when I have passed at evening, I believe that oftentimes a full half hour together, I have stood mute looking at the grave in which he lies. Mary Wilson Craft. And it's signed by the doctor who looked after her. In her final illness. Wow. And that's her signature. Oh my god, that's amazing. Other than that, there you go. There's Mary Wilson. Okay. So you you help yourself. Okay. You know how to do it. Yeah. I so, trust you. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> The lake was shining clear among the hoary mountains. From the shore, I pushed and struck the oars and struck again in cadence. And my little boat moved on, even like a man who walks with stately step through bent, though bent on speed. It was an act of stealth and troubled pleasure, nor without. The voice of mountain echoes did my boat move on, leaving behind her still on either side, small circles glittering idly in the moon until they melted all into one track of sparkling light. A rocky steep uprose above the cavern of the willow tree and now
now as suited one who proudly rode with his best skill, I fixed a steady view upon the top of the same craggy bridge. The bound of the horizon behind was nothing but the stars and the gray sky. She was an elfin penance. Lastly, I dipped my oars into the silent place, and as I rose up, the stroke of my boat went heaving through the water like a swan. When from behind the craggy steep, till then, Farewell, thou little nook of mountain ground, thou rocky corner in the lowest stair of that magnificent temple which doth bound one side of our whole vale with grandeur rare. Sweet garden orchard, eminently fair, the loveliest spot that man hath ever found. Farewell. We leave thee to heaven's peaceful care, thee and the cottage which, which doth, thou dost surround. Our boat is safely anchored by the shore, and there will safely ride when we are gone. The flowering shrubs that deck our humble door will prosper, though unattended and alone. Fields, goods, and far-off chattels, we have none. These narrow bounds contain our private store of earth, of things earth makes, and sun doth shine upon. Here are they in our sight, we have no more. Sunshine and shower be with you, bud and bell. For two months now in vain we shall be sought. We leave you here in solitude to dwell with these, our latest gifts of tender thought. Thou, like the morning, in thy saffron coat, bright goin' and marsh marigold, farewell whom from the borders of the lake we brought and placed together near our rocky well. We go for one to whom ye will be dear, and she will prize this bower, this Indian shed, our own contri contrivance building without peer, a gentle maid whose heart is lowly bred, whose pleasures are in wild fields gathered with joyous joyousness and with a thoughtful cheer will come to you. To you herself will wed and love the, ble and love the blessed life that we lead here. Dear spot, which we have gathered with tender heed, bringing the chosen plants and blossoms blown among the distance, the distant mountains, flower and weed, which thou dost, thou hast taken to thee as thy own, making all kindness registered and known. Thou for our sakes, thou nature's child indeed, fair in thyself and beautiful alone, hast taken these, hast taken gifts which thou dost little need, and O most constant yet most fickle place, thou hast thy wayward moods as thou dost show to them who love, who look not daily on thy face, who being loved in love no bounds dost, dost know, and sayest when we forsake thee, let them go. Thou, thou easy hearted thing, with thy wild race of weeds and flowers, till we return be slow, and travel with the year at a soft pace. Help us to tell her tales of years gone by, and this sweet spring, the best beloved and best, Joy will be flown in its mortality. Something must stay to tell us of the rest. Here thronged with primroses, the steep rock's breast glittered at evening like a starry sky. And in this bush, our sparrow built her nest, of which I sang one song that will not die. O oh, happy garden, whose seclusion deep hath been so friendly to industrious hours, and to soft slumbers that did gently steep our spirits, carrying with them dreams of flowers, and wild notes warbled among leafy bowers, two burning months left summer over leap, and coming back with her feet and jars until I was happy again shot. I wander lonely as a cloud that floats on higher bells and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd, a host of golden daffodils, along the lake beneath the trees, ten thousand dancing in the breeze. The waves beside them danced with day or did the sparkling waves in glee, a poet could not but be gay in such a laughing company. I gazed and gazed for little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For off the midnight couch I lie in back in her intensive mood. They flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. Okay, so these are actually Samuel Taylor Coleridge's teacups. Oh my god! <laughs> wow. I knew it. Wow. So, which is why I really wanted to do it for coffee. Oh, amazing. It is amazing. Are they Wedgwood? What, no. Because you have a connection no, with no, the Wedgwood no. family, with the no, legacy, they, yeah. They, oh, wow. I've still got three coins. Holy mackerel. Oh, so, oh, no. You are kidding me. No, I'm not. And now, with glimpses 
of half-extinguished thought, with many recognitions dim and faint and somewhat of a sad perplexity, the picture of the mind revives again. But here I stand, not only with the sense of present pleasure, but with pleasing thoughts that in this moment there is life and food for future years. And so I dare to hope, though changed no doubt, from what I was when first I came among these hills, when like a row I bounded over the mountains of the deep rivers and the lonely streams, wherever nat nature led, more like a man flying from something that he dreads, that one who saw the thing he loved.